The following podcast was made possible by the sponsorship of Teresa Leong Lee and by Catholic Digital Resources, where you can find downloadable faith formation resources and evangelization tools. Visit Catholic Digital Resources at CatholicDR.com to build your own faith and the faith of others. That's CatholicDR.com. I'd like to welcome to today's show my husband, Ralph. He and I founded Good News Ministries together back in 1995. Thanks for joining me today, Ralph. Thank you, Terry. It's a pleasure being in the studio here with you today. Recently, Ralph and I went to a funeral of a neighbor who was a Jehovah Witness. Well, it wasn't really a funeral. It was a memorial of the person's life. There was no casket, no urns with ashes, nothing that I would consider to be a religious service. It was an hour-long storytelling about the woman who had died. The leader of the congregation gave a very long eulogy. At the end, everyone sang a song about the afterlife, one that we had never heard before. However, the description of the afterlife that we heard from the leader was not one that I want to believe in. There was no joy in it. No awareness of going to a better place. No point in dying. In true Christianity, where Jesus is our divine Savior, who took our sins upon himself when he died, and whose resurrection gives us eternal life, which is something that Jehovah's Witnesses don't have, they don't believe in that. With that kind of faith, there is a point in dying, a very important point in dying. In true Christianity, we die to be perfected. We die to become completely holy, purged of all that is not of God, to enter into the fullness of God's love and God's life, eternal life, which we can never completely understand and receive while we are still in our earthly lives with our limited brains and our limited understanding. Our neighbor's friends and family who are Jehovah's Witnesses sadly think that she has just gone to sleep and can do no more while she awaits the day when the earth is perfected. And how does it get perfected? People have to become perfect enough for the earth to become like the Garden of Eden used to be. People have to do it. I don't know about you, Ralph, but I don't want to wait for people to become perfect. That's true. It would be a definitely a long, long wait. See, Jehovah Witnesses believe that Adam and Jesus were the only two men who were created to be perfect. Now, we know Adam screwed up, so I don't know about him being perfect. He was, he was created perfect, but he screwed he up. He screwed up. <laughs> and Jehovah Witnesses believe that... Only Jesus did not screw up, but he was just a man like Adam. And the only difference between the two is one messed up and the other one didn't. And they believe that Jesus came as a Messiah to show us what perfection looks like so that we know what to imitate. They believe that Jesus is the reincarnation of St. Michael the Archangel, and he is the Son of God now, only in the same sense that we are all sons and daughters of God. They believe he sacrificed his life to show us what it is like to be a perfect human. But there is no divine savior in their beliefs. There is no understanding that we need a savior for this. You know, there's no understanding that, that we cannot reach that perfection on our own and that's why we need a savior. They also don't have supernatural grace that's available to help us in our struggle against our imperfections, against our sins. There is no supernatural grace that comes from sacraments, such as the sacrament of confession, because the sacraments are God's divine gifts given to us directly by Jesus, who is God. Without these sacraments, how, how can one get to heaven? How can one reach the perfection that comes from God because we can't do it ourselves. You know, that we have tools. These sacraments are tools that are gifts from God so that we can become holier. We can become more like Christ 
admittedly never able to become fully like Christ in this earthly life. And this is why there's a point in dying so that we can get to the next life to reach the perfection that comes by living in heaven, by being alive in heaven, not just asleep in heaven. When I go to a Catholic funeral, I come away from it sad for the loss that the friends and family are suffering, but full of joy for the new life that the person who has passed away has entered into. When you go to a Catholic funeral, what do you think heaven is like? What do you think about in regards to the person who has passed away? What do you think their life is like now? What do you think the point of the funeral mass is? We often in the Catholic faith talk about we need to pray for our loved ones because they're in purgatory. But in asking you the question, what do you think heaven is like? I include purgatory in this. Let's think for a moment about purgatory, not as a place of suffering, because that's only part of it. St. John Paul II pointed out that there is joy in purgatory. There is joy even while our friends and family who have died and are not yet in the fullness of heaven, even while they are going through the painful process of being purged, purged of everything that is not holy, they're experiencing the excruciating pain of regret and remorse and whatever other sufferings that was caused by the sinfulness that they died in. So in a way, purgatory is like God's waiting room where people are getting, getting ready for the fullness of heaven. Okay, yes. Sometimes I think of it as the suburbs of heaven. Yes. <laughs> well, for the sake of this discussion, let's stay focused on the joy of purgatory, not the sufferings that your loved ones are going through. The joy of purgatory and heaven. It's the same joy. Purgatory is part of getting into heaven. The joy is the same, except once we reach the fullness of heaven and are finished with purgatory, there's, there's no suffering left. Everything in purgatory that's good, let's think about that. What do you think that the goodness of purgatory and heaven look like? While I was growing up, I was a Protestant. And I was taught very little about heaven. I had very little understanding of what heaven is like. It seemed to me to be a, just a place of floating around as a spiritual being. Maybe I had wings. Maybe I was, you know, like an angelic being. But I was happy to be with God. And that is all I could imagine. And frankly, that sounds rather boring to me. My understanding changed after I began to look into the teachings of the Catholic Church and after I was filled with the Holy Spirit and began to enjoy an active personal relationship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit teaches us everything we need to know. This is what Jesus promised to us when he gave us the Holy Spirit. Once I entered into that twofold thing, looking into the teachings of the Catholic faith, and a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, I began to have a better understanding of heaven. And this is what I'd like to share with you today. And actually, if you talk to Catholics or pretty much anyone in the Christian faith, most people really haven't given much thought to what heaven's like. They all want to go there, of course, uh, and they all think they can get there by various means, uh, even the skeptics among us, which means there's something deep down in the human psyche that knows there's something beyond this world of suffering, living, dying, and being buried in the ground. They know there's something beyond, but they have a very limited view of it. They think you're going to float around with wings, maybe learn harp playing, maybe sing hymn after hymn after hymn, day after day after day, century after century after century. And for most people, that's a pretty boring view. Especially if they didn't have a good singing voice on earth. Yes. <laughs> and in heaven, of course, we have perfect singing voices. But I think there's more to heaven than just singing all the time. Yes, we'll be praising God and singing as part of that worship. And scripture does talk about that. But that's not all there is to heaven. But before I get into more of that, I'd like to bring up something that you brought up, Ralph, about 
you know, everybody has this instinctive desire to believe that there is an afterlife, that there is a heaven, even the people who don't believe in Christ. They want there to be an afterlife. And so there's a lot of people who think that all roads lead to heaven, and that's not true. And I think we need to point that out because it is only Christ who can get us into heaven because on our own, as we said before, we cannot be perfect enough. We cannot be holy enough by our own efforts. We need the sacraments and we need the salvation that Jesus provided. That's true, Tara. And uh, in the Bible, it says the, the pathway to heaven is narrow. And it's even been compared to trying to pass through the eye of a needle, a camel passing through the eye of a needle. Whereas we're often told the highway to hell is a 10-lane, multi-lane highway. Paved with good intentions, but wrong motives. Yes. Is that just, intentions and motives, is that the same thing? There's a lot of people, I really believe, who don't know Christ and they die without really understanding the true Jesus. There are a lot of people, I believe, who reject faith in Christ because they haven't discovered yet what Jesus is really like. They're believing false ideas about Jesus, and they don't understand that they're believing false ideas. And sometimes we inadvertently, we who are Christians, give them false ideas. Like, for example, our prayers don't get answered as fast or the way we want them to be. And so we feel that Jesus has let us down. And the non-Christians around us observe this, this, you know, what's the point in praying if our prayers aren't answered? And so inadvertently, through our own lack of faith growth and our own lack of understanding the, the teachings of the church and the teachings of scripture, we inadvertently portray to others somebody that is not the true Jesus Christ. And and there are many ways we do that. And don't have time in this particular podcast to cover that. I have already covered that in some of my previous podcast episodes. So go back and listen to previous ones. But my point right now that I want to make is that many people, when they die, not believing in Christ, having rejected Christ, but being people who love, who care about others, who are not self-centered. And if they only met Jesus as he really was, they'd embrace him. And I believe that's what happens at the moment of their death. Jesus greets them and asks them, do you want to spend eternity with me? And now suddenly the veil is lifted. Their minds are not constricted by the limitations of their earthly brains and their their upbringings and everything else. They know the truth fully. It is right there. You know, their their life flashes before their eyes, but all the truth flashes before their eyes. They have an understanding now that they didn't on earth. And that's the moment of, yes, I do want to spend eternity. I believe people say, oh my gosh, you're real. You're the Jesus that I always wished existed, and and I and you're real. I've believed in you without realizing that I've been believing you in you. So yeah, I do want to spend eternity with you. And then there are the people who say, I want nothing to do with you. I want to do things my way. I did things my way, my own life, and I don't care about how that affected other people. And I still don't care about how that affected other people. And no, I don't want to spend eternity with you, Jesus, because I don't like what you represent. I do not want you to be the Lord of my life. And they choose to go to hell. Jesus doesn't send them there. Jesus is a God of mercy, but people choose to not spend eternity with Jesus. Now, for many of us, you know, we may have some vague idea what heaven is like, but where the rubber meets the road, so to speak, is when it hits us personally, when we had to face death or the death of a loved one. My dad had Alzheimer's in his his last years of his life, and he would often wander out of the house, wander off in the neighborhood, get my mother worried, but the neighbors knew him, The local police knew him, so they would always find him, bring him back home, and he'd be fine. So one night, my mother called. She said, he's gone. And I thought she just meant he wandered off again, so no worry. The neighbors know about it. The police know about it. Uh, They'll bring him back. And my mother said, no, he's gone. I went into the kitchen, and when I came back in, he was killed over. He was dead. And it stunned me. Now, Terry tried to comfort me. She said, what's wrong? I said, my dad died. 
And she said, what can I do? I said, I just need to be left alone. I went out onto our screen line eye, and I had a very heated discussion with God. Now, some of you may think it's not okay to be mad at God. He's big enough to take it. He's, he's big enough to know your hurts. And I said, God, I've been telling people how great you are. Now you took my dad away from me. What do you got to say for yourself? And God said, Ralph, open your Bible. I said, okay, where? He said, just open it. So I got my Bible out. It fell open to this passage, John 14. Do not let your heart be troubled. You trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house, there are many fine places to live in. I am going now to prepare a place for you. And after I have gone and prepared you a place, I shall return and take you to myself, so that you may be with me where I am. God reassured me that my dad was with him, and that heaven is a real place. And the Bible says, Jesus says, if it were not so, I would have told you. No, Jesus is God. He's truth. He does not say any falsehood. So if he says, heaven is a place, and I have a wonderful place for you, I have a wonderful place for your dad. Guess what? That's not a lie. That's a reality. Heaven is a real place, and Jesus is preparing a place for me and for you. After death, if we have lived such a life that we desire to spend eternity with Jesus, Jesus as our divine Savior, and with God our Father, who is our Creator, our, our, our divine Daddy, and we want to spend eternity with the Holy Spirit, in other words, the fullness of who God is, life continues, life increases. The Father gave us life, Jesus redeemed our life so that sin would not destroy it. And as we say in the creed, the Holy Spirit is the giver of life. We need the fullness of God to have the fullness of life. When we die, we enter into this fully. We enter into the fullness of the fullness of God. We enter into the full benefits of being a follower of Christ. We enter into the full benefits of having the Holy Spirit be our teacher and be the holiness that we want to be immersed in, that we want to be perfected in. You know, we on earth need the Holy Spirit now to grow in holiness. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit so that we could become the saints that we were created by God the Father to be. If you know that you are sinning, ask the Holy Spirit to help you be holy. The sacrament of confession gives you supernatural grace to help you with this, given to you by Jesus. So you see the whole Trinity is involved with helping us be all fully that God the Father designed us to be. And when we pass into the afterlife, we receive all of that in fullness, all the benefits of that. Try to imagine what it would be like to have more life in you than you have right now. You know, I don't know how to imagine that because to me, my life is full. But in heaven, it's even more full. We can't understand that with our human brains. But let me ask you this. What is making you feel lifeless in this world? What has diminished your life? What has been stolen from your life? What has felt like an empty life? What has drained you of energy? All of that is changed when we die in the redemption that Christ provides. Not only will we be full of life, it will be more than we can imagine because we have never been able to experience it in our frail human bodies here on earth. So life continues after death in greater ways than we experience it here. Fuller ways, more beneficial ways. What also continues after death? Think about your unique personality, your gifts, your talents, your interests, your passions. This too receives more life more liveliness, 
after death. One of my favorite passages in Scripture comes from the Gospel of John, 10th chapter, 10th verse. It says why Jesus came for us. He came, as we're told in John 3, 16, 3, 17, Thus God so loved the world, Jesus came not to condemn us, but that through him we might be saved. And what is he saving us for? John 10, 10 puts it very, very simply. I have come so that they may have eternal life and have it to the fullest. And we think that heaven is all about living for eternity, meaning we're not going to have need of watches in heaven because heaven is timeless. But eternity is not just about time. It's about life without limits. Terry just talked briefly before about thinking about what gifts and talents you have. What are you passionate about? What talents has God given you and what have you done with them? We know in the Gospel of Matthew, we've all heard the story of the parable of the talents. To one, the master gives five talents, turns around, makes another five. Good work. To another, he gives two talents, turns around, makes another two. And the third one, well, he kind of buried things. The moral of that story is don't bury your talents. Don't put your light under a bushel basket. God gave each of us wonderful, unique talents and passions to use for the good of others, for the building up of his kingdom. So think about the gifts and talents you have. Each of us can use those unique talents for the goodness of the kingdom. So what are you going to do for eternity? The things that you are passionate, that God has given you the gifts for, we're probably going to be helping him run the entire universe. What are you doing for the kingdom of God right now? How have you been giving yourself to God and to the mission of Christ here on earth? This too will increase in heaven. We know that we are doing with our gifts and talents what God calls us to do because it gives us life. It increases our joy when we are doing it, but we feel like it is life-giving, not only to others, and that's an important part of it, because Jesus' mission was all about giving life to others in some form or other, helping others have life and life more to the full. But it also, when we are doing the works of God, the works that he created and designed us to do with the gifts and talents he's given to us, it's life-giving, isn't it? It makes us feel fuller. It makes us feel like our life is valuable. We're doing something important, even if it on the surface might seem unimportant. Like, you know, sometimes uh, cleaning house does not feel important and does not feel life-giving to me until I stop and remember that I'm serving the people who live with me by cleaning the house. And then I feel a certain, not only joy, but it's giving me life. Well, in heaven, this continues, but in a greater way, an increased way. What we enjoy doing, what is life-giving for us on earth, using the gifts and talents that God has given us, it increases in heaven because it, it's greater life. It's part of that greater life. This is why saints have patronages. There's a reason why we can ask a saint to pray for us based on some characteristic of his or her earthly life. Their specialty, so to speak. Right. We do will have a specialty. We might not be canonized like the other saints, but we will have a specialty about what others can ask us to pray for to help them with their life based on the kind of people we were what we were doing for Christ when we were on earth. When you suffer the loss of a loved one, if they are with Christ in eternity now, they, even if they're in purgatory, they are now a personal patron saint for you. If you had, for example, a mother who was always praying for you, know that she is in heaven praying for you even more fully. Whatever we have on earth in our lives that are bringing joy to others, life to others, God's presence to others, that continues after heaven. What gives you joy on earth? And I'm not talking about the kind of temporary happiness that comes from a self-centered sinful activity 
or some sort of good activity but is very earthly and limited to earth, something animal-like such as sexual pleasures, things that are good now but are not part of heaven. It's part of the joys that God has given us for earth, but it's frankly inferior to the joys of heaven. I'm talking about the joy that comes from deep within our soul, like the joy of seeing a beautiful sunset, or the joy of a new baby coming into the world, or the ecstatic joy of experiencing a moment of divine union after receiving Jesus in the Eucharist. What gives you this kind of joy? What does this joy feel like? After we leave this earth, this joy is even greater, more than we can imagine right now. How much more will it be? How much life will you have? How much purpose will you have? You will have the fullness of that after you pass from this earthly life, this limited life here on earth. But what is full for one person is a different fullness for someone else. That's why it's important to live life to the full fully in Christ, fully putting effort now into growing in holiness. Think about a small cup being full and a big 10-gallon container being full. They're both full, but one has more. If a person dies with only a small relationship with Christ, doing only a small bit with his gifts and talents for the kingdom of God, continuing Christ's mission on earth in only a small way, that is the size of his fullness. But if a person dies after devoting a lot of his life to Christ and to Christ's mission, and after spending a lot of effort to grow in holiness, his fullness will be a much bigger fullness. Both people spend eternity full of joy, full of life, full of God's love, full of love for the people around them, full of the love being received from everybody else who's there in eternity. But one person's fullness is not the same as another person's fullness. We'd like to close today's broadcast with a reading from the Gospel according to John. John chapter 15. It is to the glory of my Father that you should bear much fruit and be my disciples. I have loved you, just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love. I have told you all this, so that my own joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment. Love one another, as I have loved you. No one can have greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. You did not choose me. No, I chose you. And I commissioned you to go out and bear much fruit, fruit that will last. My command to you, love one another. And pray with us now for a fuller life here on earth in preparation for a fuller eternal life in heaven. Come Holy Spirit, fill me. Fill me with your life. Fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your gifts. Fill me with all that I need to be a holier person here on earth. Fill me with what I need to have a fuller understanding of Christ and his salvation and his calling upon my life his calling upon how to use the gifts and talents that God the Father has given me. Come, Holy Spirit, renew me. Come, Holy Spirit, you have my permission to change me. Amen. Amen. This podcast was made possible by supporters of Good News Ministries who hope to strengthen and build your faith. If this episode speaks to your heart, then I ask you to pass it along to your family and friends. Share it on Facebook and Twitter. Forward it by text and email. And let us know what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. How has this episode made a difference? You can contact me through the Good News Ministries website at gnm.org 
or by texting me if you are one of our subscribers on WhatsApp. May I ask a favor of you? Please cover this life-changing podcast ministry in your daily prayers. And if you can, help me continue making these podcasts by becoming a sponsor. Any donation is helpful, but we are especially seeking sponsors for upcoming episodes. You've been listening to Terry Modica of Good News Ministries. For more faith builders or to learn more about this ministry, come visit our website at gnm.org. You'll find online resources and lots more to help you know the Father's love and grow closer to Christ and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Visit gnm.org today.